Potion Masters, Chapter 27. Max leaned backwards, trying to use his weight to force the mummy to release him. What is that thing? The thing was a skeleton. Only it wasn't just a skeleton. There was something wrong with its head. In the place where a normal skull should have existed, the bony creature had an egg-shaped stone with a painted smiley face. Gordy wanted to scream, but he could only imagine a high-pitched whine. The skeleton never slowed as it descended, diving headlong into Baudry with the force of a cannonball. The mummy smashed against the wall, his grip on Max's arm broken. The two undead creatures then engaged in a wrestling match. Who sent you? Is this your handiwork, Priscilla? Esmeralda demanded. Baudry grappled with the skeleton, working his arms around the stone skull and forcing it into a headlock. The skeleton didn't respond. It made no sounds, no heavy breathing. Then again, Gordy wasn't sure if it could make sounds without a real skull to work with. It's a zombie death match, Max screamed. This is a creative twist, I must say, Esmeralda continued shouting at the skeleton. But you should have picked a more formidable warrior. I have you now, Baudry squeezed, tightening his hold against, around the skeleton's neck. Gordy could see the skeleton struggling, unable to wriggle free. Suddenly, it hoisted Baudry into the air and hurled him into the centrifuge. Vials of potions exploded, their contents mixing together and creating a wall of multicolored smoke. Baudry was down, but not out. We've got to get out of the lab, Gordy shouted, keeping their eyes glued to the two battling creatures. Gordy and Max pulled their shirts up over their mouths and ran up the stairs. Brushing away bubbling liquid and broken glass, the mummy stood shakily and pointed a finger at Gordy. Don't go too far, Esmeralda called out. Then Baudry charged at the skeleton again. There was another crash and more glass shattered and potions sprayed. Gordy and Max frantically untied the ropes around Mr. Stitzer's arms and legs. The house was once again in a state of disarray. Glass from the living room window lay across the floor, along with soil from his mom's fern. A trail of thin, bony footprints tracked a path throughout the dirt, or through the dirt. Gordy stared at the jagged hole in the window and blinked. The skeleton must have had a long running start in order to propel it headfirst into the room. The footprints headed directly into the kitchen, but made a wide arc around his dad's chair. Get to the van, Gordy's dad ordered. His voice was low, but his eyes were fixed with a determined stare on the door to the basement. There was another violent crash room downstairs, an ear-splitting cackle from Esmeralda, and then the lab grew deathly still. Gordy felt his heart pounding in his throat. Was the fight over? Was there a victor, or had both undead creatures destroyed each other? Go, 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 Mr. Stitzer pointed to the garage, but Max had beat him to the punch and was already slipping through the exit. Gordy stood rooted to the floor in the living room, watching the basement door and listening. Gordy, come on, his dad shouted. Wait, Gordy insisted. There were still no sounds from down below. Nothing was climbing the stairs. Holding his breath, he inched toward the door, but his ha dad's hand closed around his arm, tugging him backwards. Get over here now, son. I'm not fooling around. I have to check, Gordy resisted. I think, I think we're safe now. How could you possibly know that? Because nothing's coming up to get us. If Baudry had won, the mummy would have already ascended the steps. Since nothing was climbing the stairs, it meant there was an excellent chance the skeleton had won. Let me just look. A car horn honked loudly and Max's incoherent babble echoed from the garage. Gordy's dad narrowed his eyes and sighed. Okay, Gordo, we'll do it together. The basement door creaked as they pushed it open. A reddish haze hung in the air over the steps. At the bottom, the skeleton stood, head bowed, motionless. As the door opened wider, the skeleton slowly looked up. Mr. Stitzer gri gripped Gordy's arms, ready to yank him out of harm's way. Gordy swallowed. His whole body was trembling, but he didn't think they were in danger anymore. What is that thing? His dad asked. I don't know, Gordy answered, but I think it's on our side. Chapter 28. We'll do that one too. Raspy breathing and footsteps echoed down the otherwise silent street. Security lights above garage doors flickered on as the figure darted past. A neighbor's dog sniffed as the intruders advanced. Let's see. A neighbor's dog sniffed at the intruder's advance and scurried out of his doghouse, barking furiously. The dog pressed his muscle, muzzle against the chain link fence and caught a glimpse of the thing making all the noise. The dog's barking in, instantly ceased. 
The wind would eventually remove all evidence of Baudry's trek through the neighborhood, but for the moment, his ashy footprints smudged the sidewalk as well as the corners of the Stitzer's roof, where the mummy had emerged from the chimney only moments before. Baudry hobbled to the end of the street, never looking in any other direction, a tail of unwound bandages flapping behind him like the end of a tattered scarf. He crossed the road, and the headlights of the car, waiting at a stop sign, lit up his whole body. The driver, who had been texting his girlfriend with the car idled, while the car, car idled, glanced up in time to see a blur of bandages as Baudry disappeared into the shadows. Finally, the mummy arrived at his destination. The back door of the white SUV opened and Baudry climbed in, popping down on the leather seat with a squish. He took two quick breaths and then, force, and then the force controlling him left his body. His one eye glazed over and his jaw went slack. What's he doing here? He's gooey. No? Yeltsin asked, peering over the headrest. The sounds of Russian classical music poured out of the radio. Esmeralda sat next to Yeltsin in the passenger seat. Her fingers pressed against her temples and her eyes clamped shut. She exhaled through her nostrils, unclasped her leather satchel, and pulled out a vial of muted orange liquid. He's going to ruin upholstery, Yeltsin said, and he smells unpleasant. Please be quiet, moron. I have a splitting headache, Esmeralda said after downing the orange antidote. That didn't go exactly as planned. What happened? Yeltsin turned the volume down on the radio. You kept twitching and your lips were moving, but no sounds came out. The boy knows of our intent, she answered, as does Wanda. Yeltsin removed the foil wrapping on a stick of gum and stuck it in his mouth. So what? We thought they might have suspicion. There's no suspicion anymore. Believe me, they know. How? He chewed noisily on the gum. Because I spoke to Gordy, and because I was attacked by a revive... Rev vivified skeleton that was sent to protect him. Yeltsin stopped chewing. What? Is that why y Mummy is now passenger here? I don't have time to explain everything to you, Esmeralda rummaged once more in her satchel. The contents of bottle sloshed, but instead of a potion, she brought out her cell phone. We need to alert everyone immediately. Take us back to the hotel. I need to gather all my supplies. I don't know how much time we have before the board sends help to the Stitzers. But I thought you said Wanda would never involve BREW in this matter. Yeltsin shifted into drive and eased down on the gas pedal. The SUV lurched forward. Wanda wouldn't necessarily, but that won't stop her son or her husband from reporting it. They would know who, they would know who to contact. Would you stop asking questions and drive faster? Uh, Yeltsin stomped on the gas pedal. The SUV sped up, and Baudry's now lifeless bo body toppled sideways onto a paper sack printed with the logo Martin's Burgers. Yeltsin glanced into the rearview mirror and scrunched his face in disgust. Ugh, I wasn't finished eating that. Now I'll have to toss it. Shame. Stop worrying about your stomach and start preparing yourself, Esmeralda snapped. She typed a message into her phone and sent it to her contact list. We attack the house before dawn. End of chapter 28 in Potion Masters.